<laughs> Let's try that again. Good morning, everyone. Perfect. My name is Donovan Brown. I am lucky to be here because my GPS said it was going to take me an hour. It took me an hour and a half to get here. So uh, thanks for the traffic. I'm really excited to come and talk to you about how we actually implement DevOps inside of Microsoft. So with DevOps in my title, I'm asked this a lot. So what is DevOps if it's in your title? And believe it or not, I was asked that by Microsoft and then told that I have to write the definition for Microsoft on what is DevOps. It's very, very stressful. It took me 30 days to write one sentence. And then all of a sudden I found this video that I thought just summed it up perfectly. Like, wow, I wish I had seen this video before I defined DevOps. What I'm going to do is I'm going to share this video with you. And I think it really crystallizes what your company could look like before and after it implements DevOps. So let's look at it right now. Trying to refuel and change tires. New more himself changes the tires. Only four crew members, including the driver, are allowed to work on the car. It's the best time. Holland stays in his seat. Thank you. Get away. Let's watch. video and I thought, wow, like that's, that's my headspace. That's what it is. And I'm really, really active on Twitter. So I tweeted this video and I said, DevOps before and after. Generally, people got it. But a couple people, I, I hid their faces so you don't know who they are, completely disagreed with me and said there was no value in the second pit stop. And I stood in their stand. One person said, of course it was faster. Look how many more people were involved. They didn't really solve the problem. They just threw more people at it. Like, no, you're, you're missing the point. And the other person says, they didn't even refuel the car. There's actually less value in the second pit stop than the first. So by this point, I'm like physically like upset. And I know because my wife walks into my office and says, what is wrong with you? So I'm like physically like, they just don't get it. And I'm like, saying, who's they? I'm like, they just don't get it. Look at these people. How do they not see value in the second pit stop? I should write a blog post. She's like, yeah, yeah, you should write a blog post. <laughs> So there is a blog post that explains why that second pit stop adds so much value, but I want to address these two individuals right now. First one is the increase in the number of people. I'm about to date myself real quick. Um, how many of you remember a little computer company called Compact Computers? Oh, all the old people. <laughs> like me. That's where I actually started writing software. And I remember, and then you'll remember this too, when you were done writing the software, you yourself went into the server room where all the production servers were. You typed in your credentials and it said, welcome Donovan Brown on a production server. And what did I do? I copied my files. I changed the registry. I did whatever I had to do to that machine to install my software. It was just me and the machine. And trust me, I was swinging a hammer at it. Right, because my software did not want to run there, but I was going to force it to run there. And if I ran out of the room fast enough, before the ops guy tagged me, it was his problem now. <laughs> right? You remember those days. It was me and the machine. But now, think about writing software today. If you try to deploy it, there's dev, ops, QA, auditing, security, the database team, the program managers. Everybody is involved. Everybody wants to say they had something to do with deploying that software if they did or didn't have anything to do. Some of them are actually in your way, but there are more people today involved in deploying your software than ever before in our history. What was interesting to me is that I didn't see them as people. 
When I saw all these individuals, I saw them as automation, continuous delivery, continuous integration, infrastructure as code, configuration as code, better branching strategy, all the little things that we string together so that we can deliver software faster than we ever had before. And it works on both levels. Yes, there are more people involved in deploying software, but look at it as automation. And there's a lots of things that we have to orchestrate to get our code to move faster. When you watch this again, notice that these two people here never move. They are literally just monitoring that pit stop. It's three seconds now, they want it to be two and a half seconds next time. You should be doing the same thing to your DevOps pipeline. You need to monitor everything that you do, measure it, and see how you can go back and do it faster next time. If you notice here, there's a gentleman here with a jack, and behind it is another gentleman with a jack. I bet you they had that first jack fail once. You ever had a deployment fail and wished you could roll it back? And now your pipeline has rollback in it? Guess what? That's exactly what they're doing right here. Specialized task. All I do is take the tire off. All I do is put the tire on. And that's exactly what they're trying to do to make sure that they can do things more automated than they ever have before in the past. Let's talk about not fueling the car. This concept of shift left is taking things that you used to wait to do and do them earlier so that you can actually do them quicker and cheaper. And if you look at this pit stop, I was always taught, you fix what hurts most first. Is, is filling the car what hurts most in this pit stop? No, they were done halfway through. Even if we fueled the car at the same pace as 1950 today, we'd still be done in half the time. That's where you need to invest your time. But what they did first is like, let's figure out how to get these tires faster, because that's definitely killing us. So I, in my mind, how I see this happening was, they would figured out how to change the tires faster. And now this poor guy is sitting there with the fuel and it's taking him 20 seconds. Like, that guy's now the bottleneck. How do we fix that problem now that we know how to change tires faster? Instead of figuring out how to put gas into the tank faster, they shifted left technology, innovation, so that car can go further on less fuel. They completely eliminated the entire bottleneck. Right? So it wasn't that they didn't add fuel to the car. The point is that they did not have to add fuel to the car. That's a big, huge difference there. What I'm talking about is let's just go ahead and eliminate completely the problem that we're having so that we can go from swinging a hammer at a tire to doing something that looks more like this. Being able to continuously deliver value to our end users. So again, this video crystallizes this sentence that took me 30 days to write. I labored over every single word of this. At Microsoft, DevOps is the union of people, process, and products to enable continuous delivery of value to our end users. Why did I not say software? Because software is not the goal. It's not about copying files to a server. It is about delivering value to our end users. And I can do that without changing a single line of my application. I like using Cyber Monday or Black Friday as an example. The people are coming. Can your infrastructure sustain the people? Maybe it can't, but do I have to change my application to sustain more simultaneous users? No, I can scale up or scale out my infrastructure, and all of a sudden, value has been delivered. It is not about delivering software. It takes three things, people, process, and products. Why do I not say tools? People ask me that all the time. This sounds very similar, but you use products versus tools. I'll give you an analogy. A hammer and a saw, clearly tools. Did they build your house? No, they were used to build your house. Those tools were wielded by a professional, by a carpenter, by a subcontractor that built your house. PowerShell, DSC, Bash, those are tools. But with them alone, you cannot build a DevOps pipeline. They will be used inside that pipeline by a product that knows how to string them together for you so that you can then deliver code more quickly. The process, that's the easy part. How many Agilists do we have in the room? Not as many as I expected, but at least you're honest. Because most people, all everyone raises their hand, and then you start picking at them and you realize that they're just scrum or fall or something to that effect, right? But at least you know that you're not agile yet. But the process you know, you know what agile is, and many of you are trying to adopt it, but the hardest part of all of this is the people. You're here, and hopefully you're gonna leave this talk energized and excited to go off and figure out how you can do this in your organization. But when you get back and talk to all those people who are not here, they're going to keep doing it the exact same way that they've always been doing it. You have to be able to convince your people it's the right thing to do, otherwise you're going to fail no matter how hard you try. 
So what I'm going to do now is talk to you about how we did it at Microsoft, and hopefully you can take some of that back with you and do it better at your organization. So how did we become an agile transformation? How did we be, uh, became an agile and transform our software product series? How many of you remember Team Foundation Server 2005? Sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> right, yeah, it, it was rough. In 2008, 2010 wasn't much better. How do I know? Because I was a process consultant for seven years. It was my job to fly around the world and install that for you because you could not install it yourself. <laughs> and even after I did, your reports may or may not have worked. Like, it was that freaking painful to use. And what was even worse than that is it took us three years to do it. But this man has changed all of this for us. I remember the first time I got to see Satya Nadella speak. It was in an internal conference at Microsoft called Tech Ready. I knew he was going to be in the keynote. I was really excited. I was sitting dead, front row, dead center. And I was selling TFS at the time. And we had this dirty little secret back then. I always was in the meeting talking to our customers about how great TFS was, praying and hoping that they never asked me, do you use it? Because <laughs> the answer was no. We were selling it to you, but we weren't using it internally. We were using different source control, different build systems, different everything. But we were selling this to you to solve your problem. And the Satya Nadella said, we have to stop living this fake life where we would write software for others that we would not use ourselves. And it struck me like a bolt of light, like this guy gets it, right? We need to be using TFS internally because if we do, it'll get better. Because it has to sustain Windows and Office and all these amazing pieces of software that we write. And that's exactly what he did. He said, we're going to have one engineering system. Internally, your heroes call it 1ES. And that means everyone is going to TFS. VSTS is built using VSTS. Windows is inside VSTS. They have the largest Git repository in the world. So big, in fact, we had to invent a file system just so that they could do a Git status in less than five minutes. Git status, guys. That should be like milliseconds. Five minutes on a 350 terabyte repo, right? So we reinvented, and then we gave that back to open source, again, because of this man. Trust me, historically, we would have kept that internally, and we would have sold it for a gang of money. But Satya's like, no, it's the right thing to do. Give GVFS back out into the, com into the community so that other people in other communities can use it as well, and we have. So let's talk about our journey to DevOps. We used to release on a three-year cadence, and now we release every three weeks. So let's check this out. You all remember 2005? It was a little bit of a miss. If you were doing plain vanilla.net on Windows, it worked pretty well. Uh, once you had me installed, it worked pretty good. Okay. 2008, we came back three years later thinking we got it now, right? We put our heads in the sand for three years and thought that we would wake up and know with our crystal ball what the company needed, what the world needed three years from now, while Alassian decided we're going to go dominate work item tracking, and Jenkins decided we're going to go dominate what you do when it comes to continuous integration, and then other companies went out there and just dominated what you do with Git. We're trying to do everything, not doing any of it really, really well, climbing it all together and saying we have traceability. And then we said, okay, three years, that's too long to be away. But if we're only gone for two years... <laughs> That's the sweet spot. So 2008, 2010, we come back, no good. We're stubborn, did it again. 2010 to 2012, still no good. Satya shows up and said, we are gonna now start using it internally at Microsoft. We started shipping updates every three months because we had to to keep up with the demand. That is what we still do to this very day on our on-prem product called Team Foundation Server. If you're afraid of the cloud, you have data sovereignty issues, you have regulatory issues that will not let you use public cloud, you can still install Team Foundation Server on-prem. It's much easier to do, you don't need a consultant, and it's brilliantly good. But that's not as fast as we wanted to go. We wanted to move even faster. So we shift, lifted and shifted Team Foundation Server into the cloud, called it Team Foundation Server, I'm sorry, Services originally, then VSO, and now VSTS, and just wait for it. We'll probably change it again here soon. We like renaming it. But what's really cool about VSTS is that it actually gets updated every three weeks by itself. The instance that we actually use to develop it installs on top of itself every three weeks while we're using it and we never turn it off. Right? And we'll talk about some of the amazing engineering that had to come in to make that possible. So let's talk about our team structure. We are an agile shop. I think we succeeded in agile where others failed because we are a software company. 
It was easy to convince our higher management that this is something that we needed to do. When you do not write software for a living, and you make cars, and you're working really well with manufacturing, and Waterfall works great for building a car, and you come in and say Agile to people who've never heard it before and don't understand why we need it, it's very hard to succeed. Luckily for us, we were a software company that knew we had to move faster, so making this an Agile shop was really easy. We also hired professionals to come in and train us. Do not send one poor soul to be certified as a scrum master and then drop him or her back inside your organization and ask them to change this entire waterfall org into an agile org. They will fail. And I'm sure some of you have already tried and failed and you think agile doesn't work. It does actually work if you're actually able to do it. So hire professionals who have already done this, who are battle worn, who can come in and defend the process against those who are going to say no and want to continue to do it the way that they've always done it. We did that and we restructured it. We used to have dev and test, and now we only have engineers that are responsible for the quality as well as the features. Because when you have this wall where you just throw the idea of quality over to somebody else, all your developers are do is drive towards something called code freeze. Has everyone heard of code freeze? Code freeze means please stop typing. Because <laughs> if you keep typing, you keep writing bugs, and we need to count the bugs you already have. So please go have a pizza party. Go celebrate this milestone while we go and count all the technical debt that you have in your software. And then what happens from the QA team? A wall of technical debt comes pouring down over you in bugs. You do a bug mask, and then you ship on whatever date you promised you were going to ship on, regardless if it was good or not. Right? That's how we do waterfall, right? Code freeze, bug bash, ship it, regardless of whether it's good or not. But we had to stop that. So we basically brought our testing and our dev together. We called you engineers. Instead of bolting the quality on, we designed the quality into the product. We shifted left all of our testing, our automation testing, our unit testing, the whole nine yards. Now, from here, we have to go and build what we call a feature team. A feature team is usually 10 to 12 individuals that sit together and get talked directly to our customers and put that feedback right back inside of our product. What I mean by they sit together, I mean they physically sit together. This is building a team. Do we have any Microsoft MVPs here? <coughs> any MVPs? No MVPs? MVPs get flown to the mothership every year. And had you go there, if you go there, you can literally find this exact physical room. The people will be different, we rotate the rooms around, but if you're on this team, or if you're in that room, you're on the exact same team. There's 50 of these all across the world that build VSTS and bring it to you every single day. This team is one of the few rooms we can actually take a picture of and publish it. Because the team room I was in, you would not want to publish the picture of that room. I remember the first day I showed up, I was kept walking on something on the floor. I'm like, what is this stuff I keep stepping on? And I look down and I pick one of them up and it's like a Nerf bullet. I didn't understand this. Until you look around and you see that everyone has these guns on their desk. So the way that they blow off steam is someone just starts shooting somebody else and the next thing you know it looks like war games in there and there are just bullets flying everywhere. It's awesome for that culture, that team, that's how they blew off steam. This team, clearly different, which is kind of cool because every one of those rooms has their own culture. And in that room is where our program manager sits. So if I have a question about a product backlog item, the person I need to talk to is in that room. If I'm using this gentleman's API and it doesn't work, I don't have to log a bug, I don't have to find them on Slack, I don't have to set up a meeting, I just turn my chair around, I talk to them, and I get right back to work again. So our productivity has gone through the roof by having our teams co located <laughs> You're not stuck on this team, though. Every 12 to 18 months, we allow the teams to actually move around. We call it the yellow sticky exercise. Each of the 50 leads get up and pitch why you want to be on their team for the next 12 to 18 months. The engineers put their names on yellow stickies, and they put their names on their first, second, and third choices. 80% of the people go back to the team that they were already on, because again, they like the culture, they've already bought their Nerf guns, right? So, like, I don't want to go to another room, and it's really nice and easy. But 20% rotate around, which is fantastic, because we get that cross-pollination of engineers and experiences across all of our teams when we're building the STS. Again, they are completely autonomous. They have what we call aligned autonomy. What I mean by aligned autonomy is, as a feature team, you can use Scrum, you can use Agile, you can use Kanban, you can use extreme programming, but we are going to come together every three weeks and ship software. So you're autonomous, but you're aligned by that three-week boundary that we have. Right? So if you want to do paired programming, knock yourself out. If you don't, we're not going to force you to do that. Just deliver every three weeks like you're supposed to, and then we're going to go back and review the process afterwards. So it's really nice that these teams are completely autonomous. 
We run three-week sprints at Microsoft. Do not run three-week sprints because we run three-week sprints. When I was a process consultant, I have to go in and ask you lots of questions, learn your environment to determine what your sprint length should be. When I work on things like the stock market, the sprint lengths are very, very short, even a week long, right? Because the decisions I make on Monday might be nonsense by Friday, right? So I can't sit here and just drive blindly for three weeks on a bad decision and the market's changing. When I worked in the medical industry, it was a four-week sprint. So I couldn't get a physician to stop billing to come and look at our sprint review any more frequently than four weeks. But how did Microsoft get to three weeks? I wasn't there when they picked it. So I asked Aaron Bjork, who was. He said, well, it's funny, Donovan. We call it the Goldilocks syndrome. I'm like, what do you mean? He says, well, we tried two weeks and it felt too small. We tried four weeks and it felt too big. When we got to three weeks, it felt just right. It's like, yeah, Don, because think about it. Agile has lots of ceremony, right? Daily stand-ups, sprint reviews, sprint planning, retrospectives. And when you're running a one-week sprint, you feel like you're in meetings more than you are actually working. But then when you're on a four-week sprint, everybody tries to make it a calendar month, and it never fits, right? You want to start on January 1st and then on January 30th or 31st, but it never works. And all, not to mention, estimating what I can do four weeks from now is horribly bad. We're really inaccurate. But three weeks was that sweet, sweet spot. So that's why we run three-week sprints. We've been doing it ever since. But you might be asking, we run three-week sprints, but why do they overlap the way that they do? That last week is the deployment of the STS on top of itself from the last sprint. And it's a completely automated process, so it overlaps the beginning of our next sprint. We're so big now that if everything goes great, it takes about 10 days to deploy the STS from one ring to the other, because we practice what we call safe deployment, which means we don't deploy it out into production for everyone. We first deploy it to what we call ring one, Ring one is actually where the VSTS team works. So if we screw up, we're the ones who pay the price first. And only if it's good enough for us do we then roll it out to our customers and more and more and more until it's out to everyone. This allows us to mitigate a lot of risk that way. Sprint planning, we're done. The deployment overlaps the beginning of the next sprint. But the question is, how do you keep 50 feature teams in sync? Believe it or not, we use email. At the beginning of the sprint, the PM sends an email saying, this is everything that we pay to deliver in the next three weeks. Three weeks from then, you get another email. It says, this is what we were able to deliver, and here is a three to five minute video as if you had set in our sprint review. This is the code actually being used so that you can see exactly what's working on. Now I can keep up to date with 50 feature teams across the world, no matter what time zone that they're actually in. That video had a neat side effect. You cannot use after effects or any special effects to make the software look like it was working. The software actually has to work, which means to produce the video and put it out on the last day means the software has to be done several days before that. So it was a forcing factor to get our developers to get stuff done so that the PM could produce the video, which also gave them the opportunity to look at the video, make sure that the product did what they wanted it to do, and even polish it a day or two if they needed to, to put the video out for our end users, which is really, really cool. If you've ever used TFS or VSTS, you recognize that. That little chart right there is just a work item query. I can actually click on any one of those links and actually go directly to that particular work item if I want to learn more about it. Three weeks later, I get this video. This video basically says, this is what we did. And now I can keep up to date with where everything is happening with all 50 feature teams. How will you do planning? We do a 18 month scenario. We basically say, here it is. Today is January 1st. Knowing everything we know about the industry, everything that we've learned from the trade magazines, from the conferences that we've attended to, and that what our customers have said, where does our product need to be 18 months from now? It's just a vision. And if we look back 18 months and we've only done 60% of that, that's a success because stuff changes over time. We then break that down into what we call two six-month seasons. One season is Microsoft Build. Is everyone familiar with Build? It's a really big conference. None of you ever heard of Build? Okay. Okay, so Bill is a really big conference that we do at Microsoft, and we basically want to make big announcements there. The other one used to be Connect in November, and we would make big announcements there as well. And we would break up what do we want to deliver at Bill and what do we want to deliver at Connect. And then we would start sprinting every three weeks, and then six months from now, we'd say, the world has changed. 18 months from this moment, where do we need to be? And we simply rinse and repeat this every six months, making sure that we recalibrate what it is that we're going to be delivering going forward. One thing I did not discuss on this slide is this section right here. Every three sprints, the teams that are related to each other come together. For example, work item tracking has about five or six different teams. Team owns the product backlog, team owns integration, team owns the Kanban board, things like that. All those teams eventually come together 
And when they come together, they talk about what they're going to be doing for the next three sprints. I got to sit in one of these meetings once for the workout and tracking team. And one of the guys said, hey, this is what we're going to be doing. We're going to create this brand new widget that's going to do X, Y, and Z. And another lead said, hey, I had an engineer just write that exact same widget for something that we were doing. Why don't you use their widget instead? Had we not had that meeting, we have two widgets doing the exact same thing with our own set of bugs in them that we have to go back and fix. So allowing your teams to come together and communicate allowed us to reuse code more effectively than we had in the past. I'm speeding up a little bit because my timer says only have five minutes left. Uh, we talked a little bit about quality. We all remember code freeze, stop typing please, and then you basically would pay down your technical debt, and then hopefully you would go back and ship it. This is not a good way to write software because you don't know how much technical debt you've incurred until you stop to count the bugs. But you only know that because you weren't testing it when you wrote it. Right? So you have to start testing the code sooner so that you know how much technical debt that you were carrying. Buck Hodges wanted to be one week away from shipping. He did some math, and he, Buck Hodges, by the way, is our director of engineering at Microsoft. So he owns all the engineering for BSTS. And he did realize that, on average, we can clear one bug per engineer per week. So if no team carries more than five bugs per engineer, then we can ship. When I say, stop what you're doing, I want to ship a week from now and pay down the technical debt. Once you go above five bugs per engineer, someone has to stop what they're doing and pay down the technical debt. Because it's just like financial debt. The longer you let it wait, the harder it is to pay down. So we wanted to go from the big curve to the little curve. And we do that by tracking something called a bug bar. These are statistics that we capture on how many bugs each one of the teams is actually carrying. The most important thing I can say about this slide is do not punish the teams who go above the bug bar. Engineers are very smart people. If you punish me for these numbers, these numbers will be perfect. <laughs> Even if they're not supposed to be perfect. What you're supposed to do here is what we do in Agile Mindset is you're supposed to inspect and adapt. If you find a team who's half struggling to stay below the bug bar, go have a conversation with them and find out why. Bad estimating, did we overtax you? Do you need more training? Do you need more capacity? Why did we as leadership fail you that you were not able to stay below that bug bar? And then you go back in, you make a change, and you go back and you reevaluate this. We don't just do this for bugs. We also do this for our actual engineering. This is the running of VSTS. We measure everything. This is what we call where we measure our live site incidences. If at any point in time, VSTS stops working and cannot deliver to you the value that we promised, we track that as an LSI. We measure how long it took us to detect, how long it took us to mitigate, how long it took us to root, root cause. Was it our telemetry that told us about it? Was it an email from our customer, which is the worst possible way to find out you have an issue? We track all of that. And this is owned by Dev and Ops together. At Microsoft, if you wrote it, you run it, which is a drastically different mindset. How do you make a developer a good tester? You wake their asses up. I really mean it. Right? Back in that compact, as soon as I ran out of that room, if the software is crashed, it wasn't my problem anymore. It was the off person's problem. They were the one being woken up in the middle of the night. I wake up in the morning all fresh and oh, great night's sleep. This poor person's pulling their hair out. So they log a bug. Eh, I might get to that bug today. Maybe I don't get to that bug today. So I'm going to sleep tonight regardless if I fix that bug or not. At Microsoft, you write it, you run it, which means you have a pager. If your software crashes at 4 o'clock in the morning, it's you that wakes up at 4 o'clock in the morning. Guess what that does to code quality? It goes through the roof, right? Because I want to sleep at night. And I'm going to write whatever code I have to make sure that I get a good night's sleep. And that's exactly what we had to do. This was a huge change. A lot of people did not like this. Some people left the team because they knew what kind of software they were writing. <laughs> Luckily, it's not the same person on call all the time. That rotates, right? So everyone feels that pain. Everyone understands what it means to write good software. And we move forward as a company. I only have one minute left, so just wrap up really quick. Some of the things that we had to do, we had to go from a multi-year cadence to a cloud cadence. What we call cloud cadence is moving as fast as you possibly can. Uh, we had to combine our dev and ops into engineers so that the quality was baked into the product, not bolted on after, which is really important. We also went from, we had mostly manual and automated testing. Our automated testing at the high point, I think, was 27,000 automated tests. Not once did they ever pass all at once. Never once was it all green. So the engineers weren't even listening to that signal. Something always fails. So I'm not, I don't care if they fell or not. So it wasn't even valuable. They were expensive, they were slow, and no one was paying attention to the signal anyway. So we re-architected our software such that we could write unit tests to cover that same piece of code. And now all of a sudden, they can run 70,000 unit tests in less than 10 minutes. Right? Our people get instant signals. And if any of them fail, your pull request gets stopped, and you've got to go figure out why that bug actually 
creep back into your code. So we had to re-engineer our software. And that's one of the points I want to make before I have to get off stage. <coughs> Don't think that getting good at DevOps is just finding the right tool chain, finding the right products to string together. It's not. You might actually have to re-architect your software to be able to deploy at the speed in which you want to deploy. We did that multiple times. Last thing I'll say before I leave is microservices is a good, a good example of this. When I have a microservice that depends on you and you depend on him, generally you get deployed first and then you get deployed and then I can deploy safely. But that automatically has complicated our deployment because now we have to order the deployment and not even mention make sure everything goes successfully, but you have to go first and then you have to go then I have to go. But what if, no matter our dependency chain, I can go anytime I wanted to go? Right? But your microservices just aren't written to do that. Right? That is something you had to architect inside your product. And of the 30 or 40 microservices that we have today, we can deploy them in any order, no matter what versions they depend on their peers from, and they negotiate how to talk at runtime. Right? Again, we had to re-architect our software so that we could deploy at the speed in which we wanted to deploy. I'm going to skip one slide, but you can download these from my website. This is my team, very proud of these people. If you ever need us, you can actually use this hashtag on Twitter. We're extremely active. If you use that hashtag, it's sort of like a bat signal. <laughs> All five of us will go and read your tweet, and if we don't know the answers, we will literally add someone from inside of Microsoft to that tweet to go answer your question for us. It was used over 900 times in the last six months to engage with Microsoft. So I encourage you, please do not go and tweet, I wonder if this is going to work, because yes, it works, and we all have to read it, and people do it every conference, so just use it when you actually have a question, okay? Uh, and here are some more resources, take out your phones real quick, take a picture of that. A lot of great content that we have so that you can learn about what we're doing on DevOps, what we're doing at, inside of Microsoft, and what we're doing with Azure. Sorry I'm a little over, but thank you so much for having me again.